Okay, so Proverbs chapter 2, we're going to read verse 1. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. So notice what it says in verse 1. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Um, Solomon is explaining, well, God is explaining to us that we need to hide God's commandments. Hide God's commandments. And we need to see exactly what that means. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And you'll see exactly what it means to hide God's commandments. And when you understand how to hide God's commandments, it'll make you much better of a Christian. And it'll help you to grow mightily in the Word of God. So, that's why Solomon is telling and God is telling us to hide his commandments. Look at Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, <clears throat> Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So when you hide God's commandments, when you have them hid within you, you do not sin against him. It's, it's what, what, he, what, what David is explaining, what God is explaining in the book of Psalms is that when you have memorized a commandment, you have hid it in your heart. It's, it's as if when you hide something, you know what's there. Like, let's say you were to, you know, put a plate of food down, but you wanted to hide it from your dog, and you would put, like, a bowl over it or something like that. You know what's under it, and you know it's there. It's yours because you have hid it. If you have hid something, that means you have knowledge of it, where it is, what it is, and how to use it. And that's what the Bible's saying here in Psalm 119, verse 11, that when you hide God's commandments, when you start to memorize Scripture, when you start to memorize memorize the Word of God, then you will not sin against Him. And that's exactly what we're learning in the book of Proverbs in chapter 2. It says, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, then you will be able to incline your ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. You need to have wisdom in God's Word. You need to know that and understand that. Let's look at John 15. John 15, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. This is an important verse for those who like to memorize Scripture, who read the Bible often and have it in their heart. It says in verse 7, John 15, verse 7, <coughs> it says, If ye abide in me, so to abide in Christ means that to, you're saved. If you're abiding in Christ, it means that you're currently there. And my words abide in you. Notice it's saying, if you're saved and you have the Word of God in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So there's a lot of Christians who say, oh, God's not answering my, you know, answering my prayers. Or God is not hearing what I have to say. Well, there's like, I, I usually, if somebody asks me that, I usually run through like a checklist. You know, uh, do you have any notable sins in your life that you, you, you know, you know you're unrepentant of? Um, do you... Are you reading the King James Bible? Are you going to church? Are you doing these things that would warrant God's blessing? Well, here we get a good answer of how to receive what we ask of God if we have God's Word abiding in us while we're saved. You know, there's people who are unsaved that have the Word of God memorized. It doesn't mean that they're going to get their prayers answered. What it means is if you are abiding in Christ and you have God's words in you, how do you do that? By reading often, by reading every day, by taking time to think about Scripture, by meditating upon the Word. Then when you ask God for something, not only can you pull from His Word, as they do in the Old Testament, oftentimes, like when Daniel or Solomon or somebody prays in the Old Testament, they will say, Lord, thou hast said, thou wilt do this if I ask. And they'll bring up the Word of God. So a good tool to use in your prayers is, Lord, your Word says blank, blank, and blank. Then the Lord knows that you have that in your heart, and the Lord knows that He must answer that because He said He would. So that's a good way to um, use that Proverbs 2 to hide God's commandments in your heart. Verse 2 again says, So thou shalt, uh, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. What that means is, you know, when you're looking for somebody, what do you do? 
You cry for them. You lift up your voice. You try and get their, their attention. You don't know where they are. You're, you're trying to seek it. You know, if you lose a child in a supermarket, you're going to be screaming their name. And that's what God is, is comparing this to. He says, if you, if you cry after knowledge, if you're searching for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, as you would a lost child, then you will have the un, you will understand the fear of the Lord, as it says in verse five. Look at verse four. It says, "If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as hid treasures, you know how much would somebody go search out the word of God if they knew it came with like you know ten thousand dollars? You know, if you, if somebody said, I lost ten thousand dollars in your house. If you can find it, you'll keep it." You can you would search that house like you know it's no like like it was the end of the world you would search that house. So what the Bible's saying here is if you start to seek God's word in the way you would if somebody told you they had riches to give you, then you'll understand the fear of God. And it says in verse five, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So God's saying, you're not just gonna this is my one of my favorite verses. This is one of my favorite verses because people just think that if they, you know, skim through the Bible once a day or read the verse of the day, that they have the wisdom of God. But notice what God says you have to do in order to get wisdom. You have to search for it like you are searching for money, like you're searching for silver, like you're searching for gold. So if somebody's not doing that, in my eyes, how can you tell me you have the wisdom of God? It's very difficult for somebody to say, oh, I know for sure that this is what the Bible says here. And that when they read like one chapter every seven days, you know, when, when, or when they're not reading the King James Bible, you know, somebody like that or, or people who often try and tell me, you know, oh, you're wrong about this or you're wrong about that. Most of the time, they're not even reading the King James Bible. And when they do, it's like one chapter. Okay, they're not searching for God's word like hidden treasure. And if you don't do that, then you can't say that you are full of wisdom. <coughs> um, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, It says in verse 6, Get, uh, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So if you want true wisdom in the word of God, you have to start seeking it with your whole heart. If you want to know a doctrine, you want to understand scripture better, you can't just expect to read a verse. You have to be able to say, oh, I need to reference this verse. I need to reference that verse. I need to go diligently through the word of God so that I can have a better understanding of what this is trying to say. But most people do not seek. Most people do not knock. And most people will not find the scriptural answer they're looking for because they don't, they don't look for it. You know, they don't search a lot of people say, oh, how do you guys um, know this doctrine? Where did you guys find out that doctrine? Where did you get that answer or this answer? Oftentimes, it's because we are seeking it diligently. You know, never missing a day reading the Bible. Making sure that you always hit your Bible reading days. Seeking to understand scripture, you know, like when you have to write a sermon or something like that, you're going from verse to verse to, you know, to Bible book to Bible book, and you're really seeking, and that's how you get that wisdom that you're looking for. So that, that is the answer to why, you, so, you know, some churches have more doctrine than others, because some are seeking doctrine. Others are just like, oh, I want to write my feel-good sermon of the day, or I want to write that sermon that makes everybody tithe more, or I want to write blank, blank, and blank. And in the end, they're not growing in any wisdom because they're not seeking it. And that's what Proverbs chapter 2 is telling us, and we need to seek wisdom. <clears throat> and the more you learn, the more you grow. If you look at Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 
Psalm 119. <clears throat> Just look at verse uh, 124 through 130. It says... <coughs> Um, deal with thy servant according unto your mercy and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made thy law vo void. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem all thy pre precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. The more you esteem God's word higher and higher, and you search for it and you seek it, then everything else will start to seem like a false way. If you're not growing in, at the rate that you desire to grow, oftentimes it's because you're not reading enough or applying yourself enough or or doing something that would help you to get to that stage you know I always use these examples because it's practical for people to understand if you want to lose weight but you don't change your diet you're not going to lose weight you know if if you want to lose weight you have to eat less calories it's just a simple equation it doesn't matter what you eat as long as you're eating less you will you will lose weight same thing with the Bible. If you want to gain wisdom, if you want to grow in knowledge, but you don't take in more scripture, in the same way you would, if you want to grow physically, you would need to eat more than you burn. In the same way you want to grow spiritually, you need to consume more than you know. You have to have more of the Word of God than you did previously. You need to read more and, ex and, and continue to grow in that way. That's what God has out for you. So Psalm, uh, Proverbs 2, it says in verse 6, <clears throat> For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So how do, how do we inquire at the mouth of God these days? How do we inquire at the mouth of God? Well, if you go to a contemporary church, what would be their answer? You pray and then God will give you a vision or something like that, right? Um, because they don't realize... What the Bible says, the Lord gives wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh, sound, uh, cometh knowledge and understanding. Where do we have the mouth of God, the words of God? Right here in front of us, right? The word of God is the Bible. So, if you want wisdom, you have to go to where wisdom is. And when God sees you apply yourself, He will make it easier for you to understand. I know personally, when I first started reading the King James Bible, it was extremely difficult for me to understand even a chapter. The verses seemed archaic, the words were difficult, I had no knowledge of parables. But when I started to apply myself, when I started to read more and grow more and understand, the more I put effort in, the more God you know, it reciprocated that effort back. So when you start reading the Bible, you, know, you say, Lord, I'm going to read three or five chapters every single day. The Lord will say, okay, I'm going to give you this much more wisdom every single day. He's not going to just leave you stranded. He's not going to make you figure it out on your own. He will allow you to grow and help you through it. In Daniel chapter 1, we know we're not going to go there. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, uh, the, the Bible is talking about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he's saying that God gave them wisdom and he, it was from the Lord. Like, they had wisdom above every other... So what happened in, in, the, in, the, um, in the kingdom of Babylon was Babylon started taking over nations. And then what they would do, whenever they took over a new nation, they would take like their smartest, best, best people that they had there. And if they were the, let's say they were the best in war, they would put them in their army. Let's say they were the smartest, they would put them with their, um, technically I guess you would call them the, their scientists or whatever, their, 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 their learners, or whatever you want to call, call them. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got chosen for that group and the Bible says that God gave them wisdom that God blessed them with wisdom that they didn't previously had just because they were being righteous and serving the Lord in a tough situation James chapter 1 just tells us that God gives to all men liberally and if you are missing any knowledge just pray to God and ask for it the Bible says God giveth to all men liberally and he upbraideth not it means he won't take it away when he gives it to you Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8. 
It says in verse 8, He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Notice, God... <coughs> God, uh, I'm sorry, I missed um, verse 7. It says, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. So when you are seeking wisdom, and when you walk in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, notice what the Bible says. He will preserve your way. He preserves the way of the saints. So when you walk in a way that is pleasing to God, then your path is clear before you. Think of your Christian life as a trail. And if God is before you with a bulldozer just laying out that trail, it's going to be clear. But the only way his bulldozer will work for you, and the only way he'll turn it on and start clearing your path, is if you're walking in a way that's upright. If you're walking in a way that is pleasing to him by reading his word, by keeping his commandments. <clears throat> it says in uh, verse 9, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. So people want to say, you know, oh, this person, um, if, if you truly want to know how to be a good person, you learn it from the Word of God. You know, when I, uh, before I got saved, or before most people get saved, you're always seeking to, how to assimilate yourself with the world the best. Like, be the best at whatever the world is seeking to uh, glorify somebody at. Whether it be looks, whether it be clothing, whether it be money. You're always seeking to try and be the best at that, because that's what's, what's glorifying. But oftentimes, people are always wondering, that's why they have, like, you know, um, uh, like dating gurus, self-help advice, lifestyle books, because people don't know how to act. You know, people don't know how to conduct themselves as humans because they're always searching for something that's physical or material or something like that or, or recognition. What the Bible is saying is when you start to seek for true wisdom, then you will have, tr then you will be able to understand uh, how to conduct yourself as a person, which is the most important thing. So the, the, the most important thing you can do is to seek to make yourself as a, as a human being, your, your personality, your, your charity better, and then you can get everything else in line. Then you'll be able to work hard. Then you'll be able to you know, acquire things. Then you'll be able to serve, and serve the Lord diligently once you're figured out. So one of the first lessons that we can take away here is that um, memorize scripture. Memorize scripture because that is what helps you to keep God's commandments. That is what helps you to get answer to prayer. And then when you have scripture memorized, then you can do what it says in verse 9. Understand righteous judgment in every good path. And, and you can start to act on those things. You can start to do those things. When you memorize scripture, then you can walk righteously. How can you walk? You have to think of this as a map. You know, the Bible is a map on a, on a way to walk in a way, on a, on a plan to walk in a way that is righteous. And God wants you to start memorizing the map. Start memorizing scripture so that when you get to the point that you're ready to, you know, start walking in righteously, you'll know how to do it. You don't want to go to a land you've never been to and not look at a map, not understand where you are, not understand how to get places because you'll just walk the wrong way. That's what all of contemporary Christianity is doing today. They're just walking all over the place, trying to be kind of with the world, kind of not with the world, kind of over here, kind of trying to be everything because they have never memorized the map. They don't have any scripture. They don't know any scripture. So they don't know how to walk the right way. They're walking aimlessly. <clears throat> All right, so Proverbs chapter 2, uh, verse 10, it says, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. So you'll start to get this when, as I said, when wisdom enters your heart, that's when you have scripture memorized. You know, wisdom in your heart is when something's going on, and you know how to act because you remember that scripture that says, I should be doing this. <clears throat> and then when you enjoy it, 
then it becomes all the more. You know, it's, it's one thing to know how to do your job, right? You know, let's say you were, you were working or, or something of that nature. If you know how to do your work, that's great, wonderful, do that. But when you start to enjoy your work, how much better are you of an employee, right? Or how much better are you of, of a worker? When you start to enjoy what, what you have been you know, tasked to do. Well, that's what the Bible's saying here. When you start to know and understand wisdom, it becomes a lot more pleasant. It becomes a lot more fun to do. I know personally the most difficult part of doing something new or a new job, a new whatever, it's learning how to do it. But once you get good at it, once you know it, once you understand it, then that's when, the, that's when the fun comes in. That's when the enjoyment comes in. So once you learn how to live righteously as a Christian, then you can mold your life around that, and then that's when you're enjoy, enjoying the most. Because when you're trying to get rid of the stuff or change things, that's the most difficult part. You're, it's almost hard to find enjoyment because there's so much change going on. But when wisdom enters you and knowledge is, becomes pleasant, then you're growing as a Christian. It says, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. So the more understanding you have, the stronger you will remain in, in God's word. The more you know, the more your roots dig in. It says in verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaker, speak, speaketh forward things. So when you start to understand God's word, you start to realize that you need to... Um, disassociate yourself with certain people, right? Certain people are bad influences. As it says here, a man that speaks with a forward mouth, you, 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 get, you want to deliver yourself from that man. You want to stay away from that way. It says, who leaves the path of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness, who rejoices to do evil and de delights in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they forward their paths. <coughs> so what this is, is when you have true knowledge, then you can start to make true friendships. You know, I know my best friendships have been spiritual ones, right? And, and your best relationships, you know, your marriage and stuff should be a spiritual relationship. Because when you have uh, rid yourself of, of people like this, you know, people who are forward, people that are going to lead you down a bad path, that are doing things that are unrighteous, then, then will you have the you will have the discretion to understand oh that person was what was causing me to sin that person was keeping me from doing good because they were such an influence upon me if you look at um 2 Corinthians 6 2 Corinthians 6 <coughs> this is where we get that understanding um of not having fellowship with unrighteousness. It says in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? So what the Bible is saying here is you shouldn't, to be yoked up is to be, you know, if you yoke oxen together, they pull together, right? So if you yoke up with somebody, that means you're spending your time with them, you're emotionally invested in them, you're, you're you know, you're your time and, and your things are, are one with, with another person, they better be equally yoked with you. You better be walking down that same path. Try and mow a field with somebody who's not willing to walk the way you're walking. But then when you change, and, and let's say you did yoke up with somebody who's unequally yoked, they're going to bring you down a bad path because you're remember, you're linked together now. And they're trying to go this way. When you want to go straight, they're going to pull you that way. So the Bible is saying, if you have wisdom, you will finally understand how to keep yourself from somebody like that. And it'll give you enough wisdom to, to say, okay, I know I enjoy this friendship because it, it satisfies some type of, uh, you know, whatever, desire or lust that I have. But I don't want to keep that friendship because that person's causing me to talk bad behind somebody's back. That person is causing me to, you know, desire the world more. Whatever it may be. You need to just have enough wisdom and discretion to realize that at an early stage with a friendship or a relationship if you're, if you're trying to meet somebody. 
the most important thing is that you're yoked together with somebody that is on your same path. Now back in Proverbs 2, verse 16, it says, to de- so when you have wisdom, then it says, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. So it just went over having a friend or a, knowing a man that can lead you into unrighteousness because he's forward, because he's prideful, because he desires to do things that are wicked, and he's not walking uprightly. Now it's switching and saying, stay away from a strange woman. Strange means, you know, um, not co- common to you. You know, somebody that is, somebody that is not your own. Like if you're, if you're thinking of the context of a spouse, somebody who's not your wife. Strange in the context of the Old Testament was somebody who was not an Israelite. Strange in this context is somebody who you should not be having dwell, you know, uh, dealings with. As it says, the one that will um, flatter with her words. So you know, it's it's. Remember, Solomon is is writing this to his son, though it's the Lord writing it to us in the same way. So Solomon's trying to guide his son, saying, you know, don't just go with some woman because she, you know, says something that is pleasing to you. Go, don't, and he, as he said before, don't go with some man that is prideful and going to lead you down a bad path. Also, don't go with a woman that is flattering to you and is not walking in the way of righteousness. He's saying everyone that goes with her, you know, kind of like the world does. So what does the world do? The world doesn't get married. It's always dating and fornication and all this wickedness. And that path keeps them in death. It's like a it's like a pit. You know when you're when you're caught in that lust lustful scene. It's like a pit that you can't get out of. As the Bible says in Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23 it says in verse 27, for a whore is a deep ditch and a strange wo- strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for prey and increases the transgressors among men. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath tensions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause? <coughs> so what that what those two verses before were saying it becomes like a, str- a deep ditch. When people get locked into you know, fornication, wickedness, adultery, those types of things, it is something that puts them into a pit that they cannot get out of. They, can, they can't walk the spiritual walk. They can't walk the spiritual way because they have now dug their, their ditch in the world you know, they, by, by going with the whorish woman, as the Bible says. Now back to Proverbs 2, it says, in verse 20 that thou mayest walk in the way of good men so now if you keep yourself from and this applies for for women also obviously you know a man needs to keep himself from a a whorish woman and a woman needs to keep himself from a whorish man you know somebody who's trying to entice you away from spiritually serving the Lord whether it be with your spouse whether it be whatever it goes for women and men. Don't let people draw you off your path. Whether, and I'm talking about in a physical sense. Then also you have the friendship sense that we went over before that. Don't let men or women draw you away in a friendship that is going to keep you from serving the Lord. Those two things. And then it says right here in verse um, 20, if you do that, if you keep those bad things out of your life, bad friendships, bad relationships, then you can walk in the way of good men and keep the path of righteousness. If you're walking the way of good men, good people will come unto you. Sorry that they're few and far between, right? It's very difficult to find somebody who is as diligent about the Lord as you. It's very difficult to find that. But when you find it, that's the best friendship you'll ever have. You know, that's the best relationship you'll ever have. When somebody is on the same spiritual path as you, then it will help you to keep the path of righteousness because you're both walking down the same way. Imagine you're trying to find your way and you both memorize the map. You're, you're going to get there much, much easier because you're, you're both walking on the same path. <coughs> and it says, 
for the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it. Before we close, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Like I said, the first three chapters of Proverbs are really like motivation to start seeking wisdom, understanding, learning the, learning the Bible. And it's like, it's like warming you up for 4 through 31 where you have a lot more learning different things like learning about uh, child discipline, about how to conduct yourself at, in a work relationship. You know, those types of things will come up. But the first three or so chapters of Proverbs are more like motivating you to read the rest of Proverbs. <coughs> Deuteronomy 28. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it's very motivational. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of the gra thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flock of thy sheep. The Bible goes through even more and more and more. It goes for 14 verses explaining how if you keep God's commandments, God will bless you in every aspect of your life. Notice how it said, if you hearken diligently unto all of God's commandments, like you love the Lord, you go to church, you read the Bible, and you clean up your life so that you're living a life that's pleasing to God. Notice what, is, what he says. You'll be blessed in the city, which is, you know, it, uh, where you would, um, I guess, congregate with people. You know, you, you'll be blessed in the sense of uh, your friendships, your relationships, your, your, your living. And you'll be blessed in the field. That's where you work, right? Your, your work will be blessed. Your lifestyle will be blessed. And then it also says, blessed will be the fruit of your body. Your body itself will be blessed. You'll be, more li you'll be less likely to get sick. Um, that's actually a true statement because Jesus, when, when he heals the lame man, you know, who couldn't walk, and the lame man gets up on his feet and he comes back, he goes to the temple and he comes back to Jesus, and Jesus tells him, sin no more lest something worse happen to thee. Committing sin can cause sickness in, in humans. Com committing sin can cause us to be sick because, remember, God is going to give you the repercussions of your actions. So uh, oftentimes people get sick. Uh, Paul talks about how many people were taking the um, communion of the Lord unworthily. You know, they were either not saved or, you know, uh, living a wicked life of some sort. And he said that many of them were dying because they were taking the communion of the Lord unworthily. They weren't like, they weren't acknowledging how serious it is to take communion. And then because of that, they were dying. They were having, and they were having physical ailments. So when you keep God's commandments, your life will work out much better because God is saying, Okay, I see that this person's on the right path. I see that they're keeping my commandments. They're being diligent. Now they're worthy to have that thing that they needed. You know, now they're worthy, so I'm going to bless them here. Because they're doing what I ask, I'm going to just bless them all over the place. Notice it says, uh, Blessed shall be the increase of thine kind. A uh, kind is like a cow. So, you're not only you, but your possessions will increase. You know, like... Um, I don't mean like you're going to get more material things. I mean the things that you need will also increase. It's not just going to be you're blessed and, and everything's working out for you. Your work will go better. Your relationships will go better. Your, um, the things that you have will work out better. You know, your day-to-day -day tasks will just be blessed more the more you are in line with the, with the Lord. And notice it says there's 14, there's 14 verses just talking about how people are going to be afraid of you. You're going to rule over other nations. You know, all these great blessings come upon people and countries that serve the Lord. But then, if you notice, let's look at how long the book of Deuteronomy is. How long is the book of Deuteronomy? Well, if you, uh, I mean, uh, the chapter, ver chapter 28. 68 verses, right? 68 verses. Where are the blessings of God? Verses 1 until 
14. So that goes over every blessing you could ever ask for. You know, your food will be blessed, your money will be blessed, you will be blessed in health, your kids will be blessed, um, your, your wisdom will be blessed in, in the Lord. And then you have verses 15 to 68 going over all the curses that come with not keeping God's commandments. So God often in the Bible will tell you the blessings and the good up front. He will tell you, if you keep my commandments, you're going to have it good in this life because you are living a life that is pleasing to me. And if, and if things are going wrong, God's there picking you up. But then he spends the latter three quarters of the Bible telling you all the bad things that will happen if you don't. And the reason God does this, what is the most motivational way to like motivate a child, right? Is it, hey, if you do this, I'll, I'll give you this. Sometimes that works. You know, sometimes that works. If you're thinking of a child and you're like, <coughs> you know, if you're good today and you don't, you know, we don't have to yell at you at all, I'm going to buy you that, that dress or that toy that you wanted. And what's the problem with that? Kids often forget or are unmotivated unmotiv to do well for a long time, right? So Christians are the same way. Christians are often unmotivated to do well for long periods of time to get to that reward. So how do you actually motivate a child to not do what, do you know uh, do things that you don't want them to do? It's not really you. You let them know, hey, if you're good, you know this good thing will happen. But more often than not, they forget that. You know what they don't forget? When they got hit for doing bad, right? As the Bible says, thou shalt beat them with the rod and shalt deliver their soul from hell. Well, God is the same way with us. He knows that if he tells us these are the blessings if you keep all my commandments, we'll remember it at first when we hear it and we'll be like, yeah, I can't wait to do that. And then like a day goes by and we're like, ah, it's so much, you know, and they won't do it. But when you start to hear all the bad things that'll happen to you, if you don't, that often is more motivational, just like a child, you know. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get hit. You know, I can't even think about the future that I might get something good. I just don't want to get hit in this moment. Same thing with the Lord. So if you read uh, verse 15, it says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed uh, shall be thy basket and thy store, cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind. So he just keeps going over and over and over how many bad things will happen if you stop keeping the commandments of God. So I'd rather obviously, you know, seek the wisdom, try and do the best that you can, walk uprightly, and then just reap all the blessings that come with serving the Lord rather than every single thing you do not working out because you're not willing to listen to God. That's the opposite end of the spectrum. That's what people should not desire to go, uh, the route that people should not desire to go. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 2.22, but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it because those who do wickedly end up receiving all the curses of God. And yes, you know, you, you may see sinners who, who have money and things and possessions and, and all that. But in the end, one, it means nothing. And two, they're not the ones that are going to be reaping the benefits of being saved as a Christian, being blessed. You know, God will bless you in this life and the next if you're willing to do his will and keep his commandments. So the last lesson, memorize scripture, walk righteously and stay on the path. And all those will let you be blessed. That's, you know, that's what Christians are searching for. They're searching to please the Lord. And when you please God, then he blesses you because, you know, he wants to, he wants to treat you well. So I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this chapter in Proverbs. Thank you for always teaching us and guiding us in your word. Thank you for all the wisdom you have given us. And we pray that we will continue to help others to have wisdom, help others to learn from your scripture. And we pray that you will just um, continue to bless this church with guidance and growth in Jesus' name.